Hello and welcome to Down the Scope. This is the first video in a series about the histology of the integumentary system or the skin, which is the outermost layer of the body. In this part, we're going to be focusing on the epidermis, which is the outer epithelial layer, with subsequent installments focusing on the adnexa, the dermis and the hypodermis. The epidermis forms a physical barrier with the outside world, but it also has metabolic, regulatory and sensory functions. It's very easy to find if you look at a section of skin. The epidermis is characterized by a variably thick layer of acellular keratin and then a few to many layers of cells underneath. You'll notice that the characteristics of the cells change as we head into the epidermis, and we'll talk about this in a moment. The limiting barrier between the epidermis and the dermis is the basement membrane. A thin layer of connective tissue proteins produced by the first layer of the epidermis that anchors the epidermal cells to the dermis. A large focus of epidermal histology is the various layers that make up the epidermis and how these cells go on to produce keratin, which is the ultimate aim. The first layer of the epidermis is a single layer of cuboidal cells at the base. This is the stratum basale, and the cells that make it up are called basal cells. These basal cells undergo regular mitosis, which produces new keratinocytes that enter the next layers of the epidermis. The basal cells also produce the basement membrane and attach themselves to it using proteins called hemidesmosomes. Above the stratum basale, we have a variably thick layer of new keratinocytes, the stratum spinosum. The cells are polyhedral, so variably shaped and they have large pale nuclei and prominent, usually multiple, nucleoli. This is because they're producing large amounts of proteins, so there's a lot of DNA transcription happening in the nucleus. Most of this protein production is dedicated to cytokeratin, a fibrillar protein that accumulates in the cytoplasm and forms structures called tonofibrils. These tonofibrils make desmosomes that form strong connections with adjacent keratinocytes. These connections give the epidermis mechanical strength and form an impermeable barrier. When you process tissue for histology, there's often a dehydration step, which shrinks the cells down a bit, but these desmosomes remain attached to one another. This gives the cell a spiny appearance, hence the name stratum spinosum. In pigmented skin, you can also see melanin forming cover over the cell nucleus. This protects the cell's DNA from the harmful effects of UV light. Moving up through the stratum spinosum, you'll notice that the cells begin to flatten out and produce dark cytoplasmic granules. This is the stratum granulosum, and the granules are keratohyaline granules, which contain sulfur-rich proteins. These proteins will combine with the tonofibrils produced in the stratum spinosum to make a homogeneous keratin matrix. As this happens, the cells lose their nucleus and cytoplasm. So, in other words, they die and leave the keratin behind. This process of cell death and the deposition of keratin is called cornification, which brings us to the final layer, the stratum corneum. Here, the keratinocytes are fully degraded leaving behind these flat, dead cells called corneocytes. These are essentially protein sacs that are filled with keratin. The original plasma membrane has undergone modifications to include more lipids, making the layer more waterproof, both in terms of water loss from the organism and water entry into the skin. This layer is continually lost to the environment by mechanical abrasion. I think at this point it's useful to clarify two terms cornification and keratinization. Cornification is a unique form of cell death that only occurs in epidermal keratinocytes, and differences in the process of cornification can produce different structures, such as nails or hair. On the other hand, keratinization refers to the whole process of keratinocyte replication and maturation, with accumulation of keratin within the cell eventually culminating in cornification. If you want lots and lots of detail about cornification and what makes it a unique process, there is a very good paper on it, and you'll find a link to that in the video description. 
Now, there are lots of differences in the thickness and relative thickness of different layers of the epidermis, depending on the location and the species. Often in areas that undergo a lot of mechanical abrasion or friction, the epidermis will be thicker and have a much thicker stratum corneum. You can often see this process grossly, and it's referred to as the formation of calluses, such as those you'll find on your hands. This is a section from a dog's paw pad, and you can see the epidermis is really thick, and the stratum corneum makes up a huge proportion of that. In another area, such as the ear or the lip, there is still a relatively thick stratum corneum and epidermis. However, you can even get areas where the epidermis is only two or three cells thick, such as the eyelid or similar thin-skinned areas. Before we finish up, there are other cells apart from keratinocytes within the epidermis. This includes melanocytes, which produce pigment that transfer to the keratinocytes to protect their nucleus, as we discussed previously. You would expect melanocytes to be full of melanin, but this is not usually the case. You can identify them as small, round, dark nuclei, often with a clear halo around them. They'll have lots of cytoplasmic dendrites, which we can't see, going out to the keratinocytes and producing and transferring the melanin to them. Sometimes you can see a small amount of melanin accumulating around the nucleus, such as in the cells here. The exact mechanism of transfer of melanin from melanocytes to keratinocytes still hasn't been discovered, although there are a few leading hypotheses. The immune system also has a regular presence within the epidermis in the form of dendritic cells. These are intraepidermal macrophages, so they can recognize phagocytos and present antigens. Their purpose is to constantly monitor for antigens within the epidermis, and when they phagocytose something, they will migrate to the local lymph node and present antigen in the hope of initiating a cell-mediated immune response. It's likely they have a very important role to play in contact allergies and other similar diseases. You'll only be able to convincingly identify them with immunohistochemistry, so they're not really a huge factor in standard stains. And lastly, just to mention them, although you'll never see them unless they become neoplastic, there is a type of tactile epithelial cell, also called a Merkel cell, which act as intraepidermal touch receptors. They will synapse with a sensory nerve ending present in the superficial dermis. There are very few of them, and you'll never find a convincing example using normal stains. So that's everything I have to say about the epidermis. If you're still here, thank you very much for watching, and I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And if you want any other topics on histology videos, you can make a comment as well. Otherwise, until next time, goodbye.